Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Ben Sheen, I'm a managing editor here at Stratfor, and today I'm joined by Paul Floyd, military analyst. We'll be talking a little bit about chemical weapons. The reason this topic is coming up today specifically is on the 22nd of April 1915, we saw the first use of chemical weapons offensively by the Germans. And it was the first occasion that chlorine gas was actually used against French, Algerian, and Moroccan troops in the Second Battle of Ypres. So Paul, the attack carried out by the Germans literally 100 years ago today was very effective for the first use of actually lethal gas. But that was really the only time throughout the war that we saw that level of success in terms of actually achieving what the Germans wanted it to do. And they were unprepared for how effective it was. Why did we see a general diminishing of the effectiveness of chemical weapons throughout the course of the war, even though more were actually used? Well, uh, the the defense against chemical weapons, i.e. The, the respirators, different types of suits and coverings mm -hmm. that kind of protected the wearer against all the different uh, effects of chemical weapons, were pretty quickly produced and put in the hands of soldiers on the front. And so the, the, after the initial surprise, units learned how to respond effectively and it mitigated the effect pretty quickly. Hmm. And again, that's reflected in the casualty statistics of the approximately you know, 16 million deaths from the war. It was only a small number, less than 100,000, who actually succumbed to chemical weapons as fatalities. But again, there are issues as well with the delivery system and certainly some of the problems that have always been inherent with chemical weapons, such as the indiscriminate nature of them, the susceptibility to environmental factors like wind, that really diminished their effectiveness on the battlefield, didn't it? Yeah, I think it's probably the biggest fallacy of chemical weapons is the idea that there's some kind of super weapon. Mm. Um, it, in actuality, they're very, very hard to get in the like done and the or delivered in the right way that yeah. actually has the effects on the enemy that you want. Um, so what you're talking about is like that you know temperature affects it, wind affects it. Mm. They're heavier than air, which they're designed to be, but that, you know that means that terrain affects where they go. And so when you're talking about, I need something that needs to be concentrated enough to to kill or hurt a human being mm. and persistent enough to stay there and actually affect the population so they can't get away, you know, in some way make it to where the, the, the subject is exposed to that weapon for the right amount of time, um, you start to add all these things together and it becomes very difficult actually to deliver them properly all the time. So the examples, of course, in World War One are they always reference mm. wind. Wind was the thing that kind of was really, you know, it was a variable no one could dictate and it could very much destroy your ability to use a chemical weapon effectively. But another great example is in the Iran-Iraq war. The Iraqis were using chemical weapons on an elevated Iranian position, and mm. the actual gas, there was mustard gas they were using, came rolling back on friendly troops. The use of chemical weapons can be very difficult to implement sometimes. Mm, absolutely. And as well as having the right conditions, the delivery system is also key, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think so I, I was reading a report once talking about the ideal delivery system was basically using a crop duster flying, you know, in the morning in cool temperatures with almost no wind, delivering in a basically in a grid pattern, mm. um, flying at like a thousand feet AGL above ground level. Uh, and so that's the best way to use a chemical weapon. But if you're talking about actual combat where the enemy has a vote, getting those kinds of conditions is really, really hard when you talk about air defense and perfect environmentals and everything else. And so it, it's really not that chemical weapons aren't effective because they can be, but it's that they're hard to use and their efficiency to be used is not as good as, let's say, just using bullets and artillery and all the other conventional weapons that we're used to in warfare. And a good example of that was looking at, say, the uh, Om Shinrikyo sarin attack on the Tokyo Underground. You had almost perfect conditions for a, chemi a chemical attack. You had a large number of people concentrated in a small space with poor ventilation. And ultimately, using sarin gas should have killed thousands of people instead of the, the six or seven people that actually became fatalities. And part of the problem was it was simply in liquid form and the vapor it gave off was very, very mild. So people felt the effects, but there were a small number of fatalities. If they actually used a bomb, it would have killed far more people. Right. And that points directly to the idea that the delivery method has to be very specific to the environment that you're trying to deliver it in mm. to get the right type of effect. Um, and even bombs have issues in the sense that if you use an explosive device to disperse mm. um, a chemical weapon, so I, I reference my time in Iraq when they tried to use chlorine weapons against us mm. by taking basically industrial chlorine containers and blowing them up. The explosion itself, while dispersing the agent, also sometimes can over disperse it and consumes a lot of the material in the explosion itself. Mm. So this this idea that chemical weapons are, are some kind of super weapon and easily deliverable is very much not true. But you raise a good point, which is almost beyond the effectiveness of chemical weapons themselves. There is a very powerful psychological factor that really affects even the mention of chemical weapons is is shocking. Right, and this 
sounds, you know, it, it's a kind of morbid way to look at it, but why is a chemical weapon and, and, and that way of dying more horrific necessarily than, you know, being shot or burned in war? I mean, warfare is horrific in general, and, and the ways you die in warfare are fairly horrible. Mm. Um, but for whatever reason, chemical weapons, uh, I think, Part of it has to do with the fallacy of how effective chemical weapons can be. The idea that you know, a spoonful of something in the atmosphere can kill forty thousand people. You know, you hear weird statistics like that, and people kind of uh, assume a certain capability that's not really there. Mm. And it's part of the reason as well why it's still a part of military training today. Even though we've seen the gradual disposal of the world's stockpiles of chemical weapons, they are still being used. We've seen the use of chemical weapons in the most recent Syrian conflict, and it's still a mainstay of military training because it remains a threat even in a diminished capability. And actually, by understanding a threat and protecting against it, it helps reduce that psychological fear factor that comes with chemical weapons. It's true. I mean, a lot of countries built up huge stockpiles. All you know, ever since World War One, there's a whole host of countries that have had huge stockpiles through World War Two and the Cold War and various conflicts. But if you think about the relative size of these stockpiles versus the usage, it, you know, basically chemical weapons have had a very minor effect on the battlefield. They mm. serve more as a deterrence role against don't use chemicals against me and I won't use them against you. Mm. Um, so they kind of served almost in a, like, like you think of nuclear deterrence. The chemical deterrence was there, mm. but the actual application to the battlefield didn't make a lot of sense. And there's a lot of reasons chemical weapons are actually really difficult. Again, the idea of these, these uh, substances are very corrosive. They're hard to handle. They're very dangerous to handle naturally. So the store of them is really expensive and then as we're finding out the disposal of them is very expensive mm. so if I start building up a chemical weapon stockpile I know I'll pay to keep it m maintain it and have the delivery systems that effectively can get it out there and also I'll know at some point I'll have to pay to get rid of it safely and in, in a manner that makes sense Paul thank you so much for taking the time to explain this today to read our hundred year anniversary on the use of chemical weapons in World War One please read stratfor.com <laughs>